Welcome to our Teach Out on Concussions. We're joined by Dr. Matt Lorenz and Dr. J.T. Eckner. Guys, thanks for joining us today. Pleasure, pleasure to be here. Matt, why don't you introduce yourself to our viewers? I'm a neurologist at the University of Michigan. I'm co-director of Michigan Neurosport and the Michigan Concussion Center Clinical Corps. J.T.? My background's in physical medicine and rehabilitation. I'm a physician researcher, and I direct research efforts for the PMNR Concussion Program, as well as Neurosport. Uh, and I'm also the research core director for the new Concussion Center here at Michigan. Great, thanks. We are in uh, the MedSport facility here at the University of Michigan, home of Neurosport. Matt, can you give us a little background on uh, what Neurosport does from a clinical perspective? From a clinical perspective, we see athletes with sport-related concussion, and this is where we bring them for their care. Great. And JT, you mentioned that uh, you coordinate some of the research, both with the Concussion Center and with Neurosport. Can you talk about how uh, the research uh, gets integrated into patient care uh, that Matt provides? Yeah, well, that's actually something uh, that we are trying to build here at Michigan is even more of what we've already been doing. Uh, we try to uh, engage our patients in research, uh, and we're trying to uh, bolster the research with the clinical population so that every patient uh, is contributing knowledge to our concussion research database, uh, and at the same time, that research database is being translated back to the patients at the point of care so they can benefit from that knowledge that we're gaining. That's excellent. So, JT, maybe um, it would help if um, you know, we talk about concussion. Concussion can sometimes be referred to as mild traumatic brain injury. Um, traumatic brain injury occurs across a spectrum um, from the mild end all the way up to the moderate and then severe end. Uh, but maybe it would help orient our viewers if you could provide a, a definition or a working understanding of what concussion is. Sure. So a concussion, as you said, is a mild traumatic brain injury. By a traumatic brain injury, we mean an injury caused by some sort of physical insult to the brain. Uh, in our population in the Neurosport Clinic, that's often a hit to the head uh, during sport. Uh, we can also see concussions as a result of hits to the body that cause a rapid acceleration and deceleration of the head. Ultimately, this mechanical input of force to the brain uh, causes the brain tissue to deform to some degree. Uh, a lot of times people have the vision of a, a brain inside of the skull just sloshing back and forth and hitting the skull uh, on both sides, and to some degree it does, but I think a better way to visualize it would be if you think of the brain as being like a jello mold. Everybody's had the experience of seeing jello wiggle and jiggle, uh, and essentially brains are similar in consistency to a jello mold. So if you could envision as this traumatic insult occurs to the head, uh, that jello mold of the brain uh, just kind of wiggling and jiggling. That wiggling and jiggling uh, causes stretch to the tissue, and that stretch is what we think actually induces the injury. Uh, with concussion, uh, we traditionally don't think of it as a truly as a, as a totally structural injury, uh, meaning we don't think of uh, broken neurons or broken blood vessels or bleed, bleeding inside of the skull. Uh, we think of concussion as being more a disruption of the brain's normal function. So brains are very active organs. Uh, they use a lot of the energy uh, that our body utilizes every day, uh, and their ability to use energy is disrupted by this insult. Uh, also, their ability, the ability for the various neurons and the various networks in the brain to communicate uh, and to do all the brain's functions is also disrupted by this insult. Uh, ultimately, to be diagnosed with a concussion, uh, the person that has the injury has to manifest some signs and symptoms to suggest that something is going on. Uh, and so commonly that would be headache, dizziness, other physical symptoms like that. Uh, in some cases, uh, an individual may be unconscious. Uh, however, in our experience and in the literature, uh, it's actually a relative minority of injuries that actually have loss of consciousness associated with them. Um, so, so you mentioned that um, concussion is a, is a functional injury, not a structural injury. Uh, does that mean that um, if, if someone thinks they have a concussion and they went to um, their primary care, or the emergency room, um, that a imaging, a, a CT scan, an MRI, that would show something, it would not show something? Typically, neuroimaging will not show any abnormalities in a concussion. Uh, we were talking about research a little bit earlier and there are a lot of research uh, endeavors going on to try to identify more sensitive imaging tools, uh, and there's a lot of promise in that area. Uh, but right now, uh, all of these research studies are at the point that populations of people with concussion look different than populations of people without, but we aren't at the point where we can look at an individual scan and say, you have a concussion versus you don't have a concussion. Uh, hopefully that's something that we may have in the future, though. Great. So over the last, let's say, 10 years or so, concussion has really come to the forefront of kind of the public's mind. Um, some of that is sport-related injury, but also some of the military conflicts we've been engaged with. Um, can you talk about, Matt, some of the changes that you've seen in your career, maybe over that last 10 years or even longer, sure. uh, on how patients are being treated um, so in the old days and in modern times? Right, and I think in the last 10 years, there's been a radical change in the way people are cared for in terms of concussion, either sports-related or just regular concussion that's not sports related. Ten years ago, I think the recommendations were for really rest until you're completely asymptomatic from the concussion symptoms. 
and then, then go back to activity. I think now we realize that was a bad idea. That used to be called cocoon therapy, so have someone go into a dark room, lie in bed until they're symptom free. That turns out to be a disaster for most people. Now we're much more interested in an active recovery program, and that's one of the reasons we're in the gym today, because this is one of the places that we go to to give people the activities that they should do while they're recovering from concussion. I think that's one really large change that's occurred. Great, this great um, positive changes occurred. I think uh, the people that I talk to, they have much more positive outcomes because of that. So. That's right, so we've also know that people who do that have a quicker recovery and suffer less from concussion if they're more active during recovery. Great, and JT, similar question to you. Um, in the last 10 years, what have you seen as the biggest changes in the, the research base related to concussion? Uh, and then I'll add on to that. What do you see as kind of on the horizon? What, what can yeah. people expect? I think that uh, we've learned a lot about concussion and with everything that we learn about concussion, we realize there are more things that we don't understand. Uh, some of the earlier research on concussion was largely looking at uh, outcomes and predictors of outcomes, uh, you know, who's more likely to recover quickly versus who's more likely to recover in a prolonged period of time. Uh, concussion research has been evolving. Uh, one of the things that's being looked at now is new ways to diagnose concussions. Uh, concussion has always been a clinical diagnosis, meaning that uh, the medical provider uh, assessing the person with the injury uh, has to kind of put everything together from the mechanism of injury to the initial presentation with uh, signs and symptoms they were experiencing as well as the time frame that these symptoms evolve. Uh, but there's a little bit of subjectivity to that. Uh, and so something that's you know big on the horizon is trying to identify something called biomarkers for concussion. Uh, that would be a blood test or a saliva test or imaging exam uh, that can actually uh, confirm the diagnosis of concussion and can confirm that clinical suspicion. Uh, one of the reasons that's important is because every symptom of a concussion can potentially be due to something else. Uh, so it's really help, it will be really helpful to be able to identify uh, when there is in fact a concussion uh, based on the, the changes in the brain as opposed to just identifying the symptoms and trying to put the pattern together. So you mentioned biomarkers. Um, so I'm recalling uh, earlier this year there was um, a press release um, about a biomarker that could diagnose concussion. Is that true? Not true? Can you maybe give some light, shed some light on that? Yeah, well, it's kind of true. Uh, the biomarker is not uh, definitively diagnosing concussion. Uh, it was approved by the FDA. Uh, and what it is really more useful for is identifying those patients who may have a more severe brain injury, uh, who need to have a CAT scan to look for whether or not there is hemorrhage or bleeding inside of their skull, something that might require a different path of treatment uh, as opposed to what we typically do in the concussion clinic. Uh, to my knowledge, that's not being widely used in emergency departments yet. Part of it has to do with uh, the technique of drawing the assay and getting the results back in a timely manner. Uh, but certainly that is uh, you know, a recent development, and I think that we're going to see more of that to come. Great. So Matt, kind of working on this, uh, JT mentioned imag new imaging techniques that are coming, biomarkers. Are you able to integrate those into your clinical practice, or where do those stand kind of in your view? So we really are interested in biomarkers, and I think at this point there is no biomarker that we use clinically um, except for kind of the, what happens when people actually exercise with, from concussion, when they're having a concussion. So what we have been doing research on in, in conjunction with JT is the role of exercise in concussion. And so what we find, and it's, it's a biomarker, but a different kind of biomarker than a blood test, an imaging test, um, is that when people are able to exercise and they don't have symptoms, that's a good predictor or biomarker that they're actually recovered from concussion. And so we're able to use that clinically uh, right now in terms of helping people decide when they're recovered from concussion and when they're ready to go back to sport. Right. So part of your role is dealing with Michigan athletes, Eastern Michigan athletes, and, and high caliber um, ski and snowboard, correct? Correct. Um, so in those decisions, those can be, you have to make a, a yes, no, go, no, go decision pretty quickly. What are the sorts of things that you look like uh, look for um, on the sideline, on a, on a ski slope, to help you make that decision? Right, and then is your, it's a good word to use, decision, as opposed to diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Now, on the sideline, on, on slope side, we're not really trying to decide if someone has a concussion or not. We're trying to decide if they have enough symptoms or are safe to go back to their activity. Uh, and so things we often look for are confusion, which is quite common. Uh, headache is also quite common. Imbalance, inability to stand with coordination or other things. Less, less well known, but common are emotionality. So people can be really inappropriately emotional, either inappropriately happy or inappropriately sad. And so you put those things together along with things you look for on the neurologic examination that can be quite subtle. Uh, and that gives you the clinical picture that you use 
to um, decide if someone can go back to their activity or not, no go. Great. So, of course, you know, I don't think we will ever get to a point where we'll be able to um, eliminate concussions from all sport, but certainly we're making efforts to try to reduce incidents, whether that's through um, equipment or rules changes. Um, JT, maybe I know some of your research focuses on neck strength, which is aimed at reducing concussion risk. Can you maybe talk a little bit about that and then other things that you see, um, other, maybe yourself or other investigators are doing to try to reduce um, concussions? Sure. I think concussion prevention is another really important area of research. It's one of my own personal areas of interest. Uh, as you mentioned, my own research does focus on neck strength. Uh, and is there a role for uh, better or more neck strengthening to reduce uh, the, the effective impacts of the head uh, on the brain and reduce athletes' risk of concussion? Uh, I think if you look out there, a lot of athletes are beginning to embrace this idea, and a lot of athletes, especially at the higher levels and especially in the higher uh, contact sports like football, are doing neck strengthening. But I think that there is room to expand that uh, to younger athletes uh, as well as other kind of less traditionally contact sports. I think there's benefit to be had, so that's an active area of uh, research for myself. Uh, in addition to neck strengthening, uh, there are other ways uh, that people are looking to prevent concussions. We have colleagues over in the School of Engineering who are very interested in designing better helmets. Um, ultimately, I don't think there's ever going to be a helmet that is entirely concussion proof, uh, but I do think that there is the potential to improve helmets uh, and improve safety uh, through better design. Uh, I think that rule changes are also very important. Uh, we've seen over the past several years uh, many rule changes uh, in sports like soccer and football, uh, things like uh, you know lines for kickoffs and, and touchback rules uh, and, uh, and targeting penalty rules. Uh, and those are all designed to improve player safety and, and, uh, and prevent concussions. Right. All positive changes, for sure. So, so one of the things I think, um, I know the question I get asked quite a bit, I'm, I'm sure you guys get this as well, or um, I had a concussion playing high school, or my child had a concussion. Um, what's the risk for long-term uh, uh, declines in cognitive functioning uh, for somebody that maybe had two or three injuries uh, in their youth and then kind of went on to just a general uh, academic, through their academic career and then on into life? Yeah, I think this is a really common question. I think we get it from most patients who come to clinic. And the answer right now is I don't think we have a, a full, complete understanding of where the line in the sand is for someone who's gonna have multiple mild brain injuries that cause long-term problems and those that have multiple injuries or a few number, uh, not very many injuries uh, and don't have any problems. Um, what we do know is obviously, and that, that's been driving a lot of the media attention, is that athletes who have a lot of exposure, such as NFL players and boxers, there's definitely a percentage of those who go on to have long-term problems. That's clear. I think what's less clear is where in the middle someone might have that exposure and then go on to have long-term problems. Fortunately, there's some pretty good science out there now for high school athletes that participated in contact sports and then went on later in life. And there's really right now, we're not seeing any signal that suggests that those people, high school athletes who participated in contact sports, having problems later in life with increased incidence of depression, suicidality, um, or other cognitive thinking memory problems. Okay. That's great to hear. GT, maybe from a research perspective, can you talk about a similar issue, um, this, this idea of long-term effects? Is it, is it resolved in the literature for the professional sport athlete that Matt mentioned, um, resolved for the high school athlete, but we're still trying to figure out the college athlete? Or maybe it's clear for everybody, maybe it's unclear for everybody. Can you talk about that? And, and if we're not resolved, then how are we going to get there? Yeah. So I, I think that the, the short answer is no, it's not resolved. Uh, I think that we have uh, gained a lot of understanding about some of the athletes uh, who do go on to experience these long-term problems. Uh, but as Dr. Lorenz said, uh, we're still trying to work out why they go on to experience those long-term problems. What was it about their exposure, the amount of exposure, the timing of the exposure, the type of exposure? Um, what is it about them as an individual, whether it's genetic, whether it's other individual features uh, that cause them to go on to have these problems down the road, uh, whereas many other athletes who might have had similar exposures uh, or other similarities don't have those long-term problems. Ultimately, we can learn a lot from the type of research that's been going on right now. Uh, what we can do right now is look at, at, at ex-athletes at different stages of their life and see what sorts of uh, presentations they have, you know, 10 years out from retirement, 20 years out from retirement, 30 years out from retirement, et cetera. Uh, but ultimately, to really answer these questions in the best way possible, we're gonna have to do a longitudinal study uh, where we start tracking people whenever they're young, before they have any of these problems, getting to know as much about them as we can and knowing as much about 
their concussion histories and their trauma exposure histories, and then tracking them over time and see who does go on to develop the problems, when do they show up, how do they present, uh, and how does that relate back to the exposure uh, and to their own risk factors uh, as individuals. Yeah, so I think that's sound, very sound scientific design. Um, I guess my follow-up question is, it sounds like something like that if we begin tracking people, let's say, in their 15, 20 years old now, uh, it may take 50, 60, 70 years before we have the answer. So maybe to both of you, uh, what do moms and dads do now when they're trying to make a decision, should I let my child play football this fall or soccer this fall? What advice would you have for those individuals? Um, because the answers aren't clear at this point in time. Yeah, I think, uh, I think some of those studies that I, um, I mentioned, I think really help inform the decision making for high school athletes. Uh, and I think those can be very reassuring. And so I, I like to educate parents about that. Everyone has their own level of risk acceptance though. And so as I use the example, you know, there's the person who's willing to jump off a mountain wearing a, um, a wingsuit, you know, and that's a lot of risk, but they're w willing to accept it. And there are people who really don't even hardly want to walk across the street. And so it's a balance of that. It's educating people about the risk that we currently understand and what they're willing to accept. And I think you, know, you also have to educate people on the benefits of exercise. You know, we have an epidemic in this country of obesity. There's a lot of kids who aren't as active as they should be. And so I think I don't want this fear of long-term problems of concussion preventing kids from being active. And I think right now it is. JT? I approach it in a very similar manner. Uh, I try to help the patient and their family understand what we do know and what we don't know right now. Uh, and then I try to help them think through the process of what are these risks as we currently understand them uh, and what are the benefits they're getting from their sport. Uh, Matt mentioned some of the physical benefits of sport. Uh, I also like to emphasize some of the social benefits of sport, teamwork, uh, and the other kind of things that athletes get out of participating in a team uh, environment. Great. So ultimately it is that weighing of the potential risks against the potential benefits and helping to guide that decision. Uh, but ultimately uh, I think the decision is in the uh, hands of the athletes and their families for what's best for them. Excellent. Okay. Matt, thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Great to be here. Thank you. JT, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Steve.